Aloha, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. This is the Politics in Hawaii series. Uh, I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Uh, we had originally scheduled to have Representative Angus McKelvey here today uh, to talk about uh, legislative committees, uh, how they work, uh, how they're organized, and so forth. Um, due to uh, uh, an unfortunate uh, communication error, uh, he, we're going to have to get him scheduled for another time. So um, instead, uh, I actually am thrilled uh, to say that we have Mr. Dave Fidel here. And we're going to talk about a few different things. We're going to actually, I'm going to try to have this conversation be about uh, health care. Health care has been a topic that's been coming up, and it's uh, uh, the subject of a few bills and a few resolutions that are being put out. Um, I'm trying to help where I can with some of that, but it's a big picture. Uh, I know we're worried, many of us, not everybody maybe, but we're worried about what's going to happen with uh, the, the Affordable Care Act perhaps being dismantled one piece at a time or, or wholesale, we don't know. The biggest questions we have is, well, what are those impacts? What are those impacts going to be for the state of Hawaii? What happened? Where were we? How did we get involved and engaged and all that stuff? Um, so let's just have a conversation about what you're aware of, and we'll sort of discuss how all of this kind of fits together, some of the bits and pieces that I've been able to uh, pull together over the last several days as well. You know, you said you were worried, and I'm worried too. Um, and a lot of people are worried, but yeah. not everybody is worried about the repeal of Obamacare. I just came from a meeting in which a small businessman told me that his uh, insurance since Obamacare went into effect, his health insurance for his people, went up 62 percent. 62 percent. That's here in Hawaii, small business. Since when? Since Obamacare went into so effect. So since 2010? Yeah. It's gone up 62 percent? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And he's really furious about it. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, mind you, um, this particular fellow is on the, on the Trump side of the polarization. Okay. And, and I think there's a lot of polarization about Obamacare, too. Yes. So it's, it's not, you know, uh, a unilateral concern or, or rather, a, you know, one-sided, one-side-only one type concern. There are people <laughs> concerned on both sides. Uh, there are people who want to see uh, Obamacare repealed as soon as possible. Uh, a lot of them happen to be in the Republican Congress. Right. Uh, but there are other people, you know, obviously like you and me, that are very concerned about it because we see an irresponsible move happening here, a move that will leave a huge vacuum, a vacuum that will affect people's lives, and, and there, will be, there will be serious medical problems unresolved, you know, with yes. insurance for a lot of people, and they will die. Yes. This is a serious problem for the country, you know, not only in domestic, you know, uh, context, but in the world looking at us, yes. uh, we're plunging, you know, from one side to the other here. We can't seem to make up our minds. I think a lot of people in Europe and Asia look at us and say, you know, we can't, we, can't, we get, we hit the cliff every year. We get people fighting in Congress, locking up with filibuster, what have you. And now we have this huge engine of health care that we're going to repeal after only a few years. Yeah. Um, terrible polarization. When terrible we're not even, you know, of, of all of the, I guess, uh, what you consider a high level of civilization, you know, first tier, first class uh, civilizations or, or, or countries out there, uh, first world, we're one of the only that doesn't actually have a universal health care system. And the, the Obamacare, which I'll make it very clear, Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act are the same thing. Not everyone actually knows that. Yeah. Um, that's as close as we've gotten nationally. And, okay, we've been able to get or through that, 20 million more people actually have health care. Uh, there are a number of things that, are, that could be better with it, but there are, there are some important factors. Number one, more people are actually covered, which means we're saving money at the emergency room because fewer people have to go to the emergency room because they otherwise didn't have a choice. Uh, and so that's a good thing. Well, beyond that, there's the whole spectrum of inclusions and requirements that, that the insurance companies are not allowed to just cut you or not pay for this or not pay for that or uh, not address a, a, uh, uh, a, a pre-existing a, a pre condition. condition. And those things are important. And there have been a number of studies done, national studies that have been done, that have indicated anywhere from 69 to 85 percent of America, of the people in America, not Democrats, not Republicans, of the people want to keep most, if not all, of the provisions that are within the Affordable Care Act. So how do they cherry pick the things that people want to keep, get rid of the things that some people don't like, and still have it function and have it not collapse? 
Well, you know, Congress, where they make sausage and all that, <laughs> it's hard to believe that anybody is really figuring this out in a rational, systematic way. I mean, it's being negotiated like sausage. Obamacare itself is 2,000 pages of, yeah. of statute. Um, you know, that you have to understand it before you start picking the wings off. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think th they're not doing that. They're moving so quickly. Uh, and they don't have a replacement. And even at the press conference, uh, you know, Trump could not offer, has not offered what might happen as a replacement. So I think the reality is they want to push this repeal through, and they don't have a plan to, to replace it. Did you see the, um, and yeah, we're talking more national than local, but we'll get to the local thing. Well, let's talk local too, because local is directly affected by what happens. Absolutely it is, absolutely it is. Um, in fact, we've already been impacted by that, not necessarily positively, actually. Um, but. The um, actually, let's just chip. Let's go to that. Uh, what we have here, we have our prepaid system, is what we've had here for since the 70s, right? Uh, there's a, a few tweaks and modifications that were made, but it's what we had, and it was in uh, 2010 that the Affordable Care Act passed, and then it was up to each state to implement or not. And it was Governor Abercrombie who said, yes, we're going to implement it. So therefore, it superseded the system that we, that we had. And we were one of the states that already had the we largest number. We had a working number. system we that had a, was very good, probably it was, the best in the country. Exactly, exactly. Per, per, capita, per capita, we had more people covered per capita than in the other state. Yeah. And, and that was with that old prepaid system. Well, we had to forego that. We had to let that go in order to accommodate, and it was, you know, a, a, some of that was, you know, how politics works. You take care of your friends to a certain extent, which I don't, I don't think that that's always the best option. But let, me, let me give you a, a scenario, Carl, and just see what you say. Mm. <clears throat> Suppose Congress, in its infinite unwisdom, uh, you know, just repeals mm -hmm. Obamacare. You know, yeah. It doesn't exist. The whole thing goes away. The yeah. whole statute, the thousand, two thousand pages, goes away. Why can't the Hawaii legislature? I mean, I wish Bob Toyavuka were here. He would help us. He was here yesterday. Uh, you know, we were discussing this. Um, so it's repealed at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Why can't Hawaii simply reinstate, um, go back to the ah. prepaid care system and put that statute, if it's, not, if it's no longer on the books, then put it on the books. If it is on the books and it was superseded, then start following it again. Yes, um, apparently there's a series of waivers that are gonna be needed in order to accommodate that. And that includes antitrust. Uh, waivers that includes um, I, 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 Medicare waivers, Social Security waivers. I mean, there's, and that's part of the problem. These are federal requirements that, in order for us to let go of it and go back to what we wanted, we need a series of waivers that people are going to fight over. So we're, and that's one of the challenges that we have. Um, I, next week, uh, Marsha Rose Joyner is going to have uh, Mr. Stephen Kemble on, who uh, was at one time the head of a Hawaii Health Association. Um, I'm, and she's going to talk to him about her, her, her piece of what she's do, doing. Uh, the, perhaps the following week or somewhere thereafter, I'm going to have him on, and I'm going to talk with him specifically about the politics of this, where it is, what the recommendations have been from HHA going back a number of years ago, um, and just give a, a, a real good analysis of where we are, what that pathway can and should be, and what legislature can do about it and should do about it. I mean now? Now. Yeah. Um, one of the things is, in uh, jumping, uh, we're jumping around a little bit here, but one of the things is HHA is currently not funded. They were... Uh, it, the, Why don't you tell them what HHA is? Okay, HHA is the uh, Hawaii Health Association. In 2009, the bill passed. Uh, legislature got put, put in front of Governor Lingle. She vetoed it. Legislature came back, overrode her veto. We have a Hawaii Health Association. She didn't fund it and didn't appoint anybody for it. There's up to nine positions to be appointed. And this is a group whose intention is to assess our medical system, make it better, and create the pathway ultimately towards a universal Medicare for all type of system. Uh, well, they were able to get some of that done uh, later, but that's because the following year, before Affordable Care Act came into place, Abercrombie came into office and he appointed eight people of the nine. Those eight people started to work on it, and they came up with a pathway. Uh, then the Affordable Care Act came in, and they got cut again. And there are three remaining volunteer members that are there that still are trying to and it's not ring the bell. And it's not funded. And, but it's already an HRS. It's already approved. It's there. 
we just need to have a line item in the budget, and we really only need a couple hundred thousand dollars. When you look at a $13.5 billion budget, a couple hundred thousand dollars isn't that much, relatively. One of the problems is if, if this repeal, by the way, the repeal is not guaranteed because you can see fractures already within the Republican yes. Party. And, you know, some of the Republican senators are getting telephone calls at the rate of 10,000 a day opposing repeal. Right. So, you know, the country right. is up in arms about this, and that polarization is playing out, you know, you know in both ways. It is. It uh, is. The, so the top five states, and this is important to know, you know, it, President-elect Trump, soon to be President Trump, won a lot of states. The top five states, or I should say the top five uh, Affordable Care Act usage states are all red states that Trump won. So if they just repeal it wholesale, those every one of those hurt. states are going to, everybody that is in, currently enjoying or whatever, who is currently engaged and enrolled, is just going to be taken away. I don't and know if they realize that. I mean, it's a big, it's a big point of self-interest for them. Absolutely, absolutely. So anyway, so we're not sure it's going to be no. repealed, but let's assume for this discussion it is repealed. You know what? What I get and what everybody should get is this going to be very disruptive, yes. not only in those red states but everywhere. Yes. Because then you have to act quickly. If, if there's no replacement plan, no transitional period, yeah. which I suspect will be the case if they win the repeal. Uh, places like Hawaii are yeah. going to have a terrible time, and they're going to have to act very quickly, yes. or there will be gaps in coverage. Absolutely, and this is the point of contention within the GOP at the moment on that as well. So we do have to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back, and then we're going to jump in on that a little bit. So thank you again for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, Politics in Hawaii series. I'm here with my guest today, Jay Fidel. We'll see you in a minute. Thanks. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on Think Tech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting Think Tech. Hi, this is uh, Jane Sugimura. I'm the co-host for Condo Insider. And we're on Think Tech Hawaii every Thursday at 3 o'clock. And we're here to talk about uh, condominium living and uh, issues that affect condominium residents and owners. And I hope you'll join us every week on Thursday. Aloha. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with Think Tech Hawaii, and I'd like to ask you to come watch my show, The Economy in You, each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Let's see reliability. Aloha, welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Welcome again, Jay Fidel. We're talking health care here. So, okay talking about what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it. One big thing that the, that the Republicans have been railing on, and Democrats also should be worried or, and concerned about this, is our national debt and our deficit. Our deficit currently sits at $19 trillion. Well, what we've got at the moment is what, what a bill that was just posed and I believe passed on party lines last week in the House, no, Senate, was a bill called the Obamacare Repeal Act. It passed, at least on, on at least so, some level. And I've read through this bill, and it very clearly states very, almost nothing about Obamacare. What it says is, this is what the budget will look like after we repeal Obamacare. And when you get to page five and page six, it explicitly lays out how the budget and the deficit is going to increase by $10 trillion to $29 trillion when you repeal within Obamacare. 10 years with the repeal, thanks to the repeal of Obamacare. Is that self-defeating? Who's going to buy into that? Why would anyone buy into that? But you know what they get to do? If they get to pass any legislation that says Obamacare repeal bill, they get to tell everybody we kept our promise. If they even pass a bill that says, yes, we've repealed it, but we're going to postpone it for two, three, four years until we have that exact correct replacement, they still get to say, we kept our promise. That's so crazy. Let's remember that's how politics works as well. It's uh, really sad. It, it, it is sad. Uh, and he claims it's a mandate. Who claims it's a mandate? Trump. Claims that but the people told him. The people to told this. him to repeal he, it. He told me he was going to do it. They voted for him, and therefore it's a mandate. Yeah. Well, and therefore that again, you want to you want to make it happen. You create a bill that says we're repealing it wholesale, and we're going to replace it in the future. 
in which case we could say, we did that. Well, he said repeal and replace, repeal and replace, until he kind of had to uh, amend that a little bit. Disruptive, destructive. Exactly. exactly. Totally damaging to the Not country. That you want to talk about the rural people and the working class people and everyone who is struggling paycheck to paycheck, week to week. You attack this. You take this down. And this, we're not even getting to Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. You attack just the Affordable Care Act, and everybody loses what they currently already have. It'll make some people happy, but who is it really going to make happy? Insurance companies. It's going to make insurance companies happy. <laughs> and, and that's the whole other thing that we can jump into a little bit as well. Um, you'll learn a little bit when we get him here. But Stephen Kemble says, so Hawaii Health Association, going back locally, he said that the single largest, other than pharmaceuticals, the single largest increase in medical costs in the past 20 years is a result of switching from fee-for-service to managed care, which means the insurance companies manage your care, which means they are in charge and they dictate what you get and what you don't get, how and when. The doctors just administer on their side, but the doctors have to spend all of their time filling out paperwork, they call it charting, in order to get paid. And they can't do a lot of things they want to do because the insurance companies won't approve it. Exactly. So therefore, the administrative costs of managed care from the mid-90s has been, other than pharmaceuticals, the single largest impact on, uh, on health care costs nationally. So that's an area to address. That's, yeah, that's an area really to look at to say, oh, well, we need days. to, yeah, let's go back to globalized billing. Let's go back to uh, uh, fee-for-service. We'll eliminate all of this extra layers of stuff. But who's against that? The insurance companies, because the insurance companies are making billions of dollars as a result of this. It's really big business. It's enormous huge. business. Huge. You know, I remember, um, I'm going to tell you, uh, it was uh, Sicko. Michael Moore's movie. Oh yeah, 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 Remember yeah. Remember that, and it was really interesting because he revealed a lot of a lot of the legislators. I mean, in Congress, who were working on health care issues, they would their terms would expire or they would leave Congress at some point. And guess where they went to work? They went to work in the health care insurance companies. Yeah. You know, with this sort of a payoff thing. It's an yeah. issue there, yeah. and a, a corruption issue, if you will. Yeah. And he revealed and exposed that if we didn't know it before. Right. But I mean, who's to say that that stopped well, happening? Well, it didn't stop happening, first of all. And second of all, the problem with that is um, when you go back into the world of politics, anytime any one of us attacks politics or attacks anybody who is a politician, you get discredited. You have, there's a campaign against you then to discredit you. And then for no matter what you say, no one's going to listen to you anymore. And that's exactly where we live right now with the general media and the discrediting of anything, anyone related to media or investigative reporting. We're not to trust them at all. So what are we, what, where are we supposed to go? How are we supposed to better understand this? How are we supposed to make decisions if we can't get information? Because most of us don't have the time. I think the average person and uh, I might be an average person, <laughs> gets absolutely depressed about this. Yeah. You make a statement that, that I believe is credible, but then the other guy says, no, that's fake. Yeah. And so the, the, you know, the claim of fake news is met with a claim of fake news. Right. So each side of it tries to neutralize the other side. This all happened recently. Absolutely. This, this is in the, the Trump campaign. It's happening every day at the so moment. So you actually don't know what to believe anymore. So no. you, you have to make new ground rules for yourself on how you find out things yeah. and what you believe and yeah. how you test on the messages that are given to you. Yeah. And you, I mean, more and more we live in a world where there are lies, pardon me, all around us. Yes. And what do we do? It's very confusing. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Huge. So, okay, back, that's a big picture thing. Sorry. Healthcare. No, I, but I'm, I'm right there with you. I agree with you. It's a problem. So, healthcare. What, uh, let's go back locally again and say, okay, a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, uh, Governor Ige uh, issued a, a waiver for small businesses as far as the Affordable Care Act is concerned. Um, in, on initial levels, it's like, okay, well, maybe that could be a good thing. Small businesses really should be treated differently. Uh, there are other ways that we should address them. Small businesses need our help. They don't need to be hurt. So how can we better address that? That's my position on it, uh, personally. So I was like, okay, well, let's see what that is. And then I started to get some business owners, small business owners that are you know, coming to me saying, well, wait a minute, do you understand that what that means is we just lost our tax credits that the Affordable Care Act was providing us? And this is for small for-profits as well as small non-profits, just lost the tax credits. 
which means, and they received, and he sent me a letter. He said, look, this is a letter I received telling me that my rates as a result of this are about to go up 43% as a result of losing these tax credits that the Affordable Care Act was giving me. So what is supposed to happen here is the governor is supposed to find the replacement for, the, for, that, for those tax credits to accommodate that. Well, that's what we're waiting for. That's so really complex, Carl. That has been, that's been waived, and now we're waiting for the governor to replace it. You know, tax that. credits are like radioactive in this state. You know, you got to yeah. approach them very carefully because people are suspicious of tax credits, yeah. any okay. kind of tax credit. And so, you know, it's not that we can launch into this on a, what do you call it, a, a, a bill that has no content in it? What do you call that kind of bill? Oh, uh, what do they call uh, those it's bills? A, it's a uh, container bill, a shelf yeah, bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a, short, a short bill. A what? A short bill. A short bill. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing in it. There's nothing in it. And then in the middle of the ledge, even though you you're supposed to file it. a bill, you yeah. know, in December, yeah. in the middle of the ledge, they take off one of these shelf bills and fill it up with something. And, that, you know, that's really what's got to happen here, because if Obamacare is repealed, then we have to make all kinds of quick changes in order to preserve, you know, continuous coverage for our own state citizens. Yeah, yeah. Well, the result could be really disastrous. It could be. Dis what we're looking at is is... Yes, we have our state unfunded liability. I won't go into all of that at the moment. But yes, we have that. But that's impacted by this. And we're talking about state employees, governmental employees, retired governmental employees who have been promised something. And here we are not knowing what's about to happen. And all of these bits and pieces of, well, this is, well Medicare covers this portion of this. Medicaid can come in and handle this portion of this. Uh, Affordable Care Act adjusted it this way. Okay, well, now what? And who's paying attention to what that is? And that's what we really need. We can't just sit there and assume, as a state, we can't just say, well, if they repeal it, when they repeal it, whatever they repeal, it'll be fine. We don't know what those impacts are going to be because no one is really looking at every one of those line items right. to see what that means. I, and I think, you know, A, the repeal, if it happens, could happen right in the middle of the session. Yeah. You know, they'll be fighting and filibuster and all this could happen right in the middle of the session. And then we have, you know, the, whole, the session is four months long, so less than four months long, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Um, so then we have a matter of weeks, you know, and then there's a break in the middle, yeah? And we have a matter of weeks yeah. to get our act together and figure out what they did, <laughs> what the effect of it is, how that affects Hawaii, yeah. uh, what Hawaii has to do not only in health care but in these credits. Um, and, and figure out all the financial yeah. implications of that, yeah. get the parties to the table, go through the sausage process. Can we do that? I doubt it, actually, Carl. Well, it might require, uh, no one likes to hear this either, but it might require a special session devoted to that only. That's what Bob said. Yeah. Devoted so, to that. Yeah. And maybe we ought to, you know, start practicing, start mm -hmm. doing our homework, start figuring out what the options are, what the issues are, well, getting a team together, maybe the HHA I team. I come back to what I was saying, who's supposed to be doing that, yeah, right. HHA, right. the Hawaii Health Association. Right, it's got to be a very astute yeah. group, and they've got to be very Akamai. They've got to have money. Yes. They've got to have resources. They've got to have access. Um, everybody has to cooperate with them. They've got to figure it out in yeah. short order. Yeah. This is not a likely of success. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's a problem, and we need to be thinking about it now, not in three months, six months, or whenever. So, no, it's a huge thing. So, um, what I want to do, you mentioned something. People are, people are wary of tax credits. People don't trust what tax credits are. People, they hear it and they walk away. I want to find the right person to come in, and I want to talk about tax credits from a policy perspective here in Hawaii, what they really mean, how they function, how they should and could function, I want to do that. So I'm going to find someone to come in. And if you know someone... You oh, Hawaii somebody. Tax Foundation. Yeah, let's bring them in. And I want to have that conversation so that we can learn what those tax credits really are, how they really work, to try to remove some of the mystique around them. Good idea. That's what I would like to it's do. It's very important because legislative policy, one of the most important things a legislature can do is use tax policy as a way to effectuate a goal of some kind. Yes. Change conduct. You know, for example, um, you can use tax policy... Um, to change people off fossil fuel, right? You know. Absolutely. And into photovoltaic. Exactly. Or, or into exactly. some other non-fossil it, it, fuel. It, it initiates and builds opportunities for jobs. It, cre it can create jobs. That, those are, you know, that's some of the tools. There are and, others. And businesses. And businesses. And frankly, businesses exactly. are the things that create businesses. jobs. Exactly. So you want to create businesses. Tax well, credits you can create, do that. Sometimes creating tax credits creates an industry. And that's what the, one of the bills that's going to be introduced is, or one of the resolutions going to be introduced uh, that I got to be a part of is the Hawaii Green Fuels Initiative, which is all about saying, you know what, this is a jobs thing. 
This creates a job. This, what this does is it takes over where the sugar cane industry stopped. We can now get all of these people jobs through a biofuels industry. So we are out of time. So, but I'd like to continue talking. Thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, Politics in Hawaii. Thank you to Jay Fidel. Thank you to Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you to the entire staff and crew. Next week, I've got someone or a couple of people that I think are going to be amazing to talk to. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about the Women's March.